Welcome to another edition of the Civ Battle Royale. My name is Dawkins, and this is episode 43, Lines in the Sand. Old wars give way to new wars, while the scrappy underdogs struggle to stay alive amid the chaos around them. Starting on turn 166, let's get right into this. Tonight on a very special episode of Seabricks. Tensions flare, wars are declared, and one of the sieves you've grown to love is gonna horribly die. I'm user The Honesty Fish, and I'll be your narrator for this week. Those of you who know me may know me as the outspoken shameless Nanette supporter, or maybe as the guy who's way behind on putting together greatest extent maps. They're coming soon, I promise. Either way, I hope you have as much fun with this episode as I've had, since it's quite a doozy. Please make sure your seat backs are in the upright position and your trade tables are stowed, because we are taking off. For this week's OC Spotlight, I'm going to throw it over to user Holy and their adaptation of Bill Wirtz's History of the World or whatever video. It always manages to amaze me how parts of the Seabricks track with our actual history and how that video is so often relevant. Now, if you'll excuse me for 20 minutes, I need to go watch something. I timed it this week, 3 hours and 15 minutes. That's how long it took Varia to read the last episode, track all of the changes, make a new map, and release it to the sub. Kudos and hats off because that is impressive work. This week, we also have the return of the tile accurate maps, courtesy of user Edzy1991. As somebody who often uses these tile accurate maps to make my own maps, I'm both extremely pleased to see them return and feel obliged to point something out for those of you who may not have considered. Putting together the tile accurate map for Endgame's smaller cylinder requires a brand new template file, which is an extra layer of work which was required before it was even possible to start these maps. Thank you, Edzy. That must have been a lot of work. I haven't seen the new power rankings at the time of writing this narration, but I think we all know that Nepal is going to slip into the number one spot, and well deservedly. I would like to thank the power rankers for finally opening their eyes and not giving it to someone weak like Kazakhstan. We kick off tonight's part with a view of the Viking raid into mainland Europe against the Prussian capital of Konigsberg. We last saw the city two turns prior, and in the intervening time the city's health has gone down and the number of adjacent Viking units has gone up. I'd estimate the risk of a flip to be pretty high, but there are still a lot of Prussian swords further inland to take it back, if it comes to that. Haida signs a peace agreement with Kazakhstan and celebrates by battering the walls of Métis city of Prince Albert. When questioned about why the city was a priority for them, Koya stated, we have to let them out of the can. He can't breathe. The icy cold stalemate in Kamchatka has been looking less and less stale these days as Shikoku's army seems poised to finally flip the last remaining Yupik city in Asia. Once the city falls, there are no Yupik reinforcements anywhere close, so Karelik will either stay in Shikoku's control or slowly turn into a pile of ash over the next two turns. What do you mean that's just a brand name for a pipe tobacco? exclaimed Koya while touring the streets of Prince Albert. He had trekked all the way out to his new conquest to meet the prince, only to leave disappointed. After all, he had important business to tend to back in Instens, where reports were leading him to believe that his refrigerator was in fact running. Despite their successes against the powder blue softies, the Yupik, the Shikoku front on the other side of their empire against the baby blue meanies, Kazakhstan, is a much more dire state of affairs. Several horsemen flee from the inevitable flip of Baikit, as any continued defense of the city would be suicide at this point. We'll have to try to regroup around Tura and hold the line there. Running out of options for falling back and regrouping, we have the last remaining Nazca city. Paradones, with three Venezuelan ships just offshore and naught but a composite bowman to defend it. Probably due time that we prime our F keys for Kawachi. Paradones is about to be pardoned from life. The Yupik city of Karalik, whose name is clearly cheating at Scrabble, now behind them, Shikoku pressed their assault into the Bering Strait. The pointman in this operation is a lone damaged settler. 
I couldn't say for sure what Sakamoto Ryoma is thinking with this strategy, but I can't see the flagman alone resulting in the flip of the Yupik Island capital. Maybe they're just a distraction until those horsemen learn how to walk on water. At the northernmost tip of Venezuela's claims in Cuba, a Uruguayan settler finds himself in a much less dangerous but equally confusing situation. The next closest available tile is way up in the top right corner on the island of Bermuda, and I'm not sure there's any real clear path for him to make it there anytime soon. Meanwhile, the war in the British Islands formally concludes with the Manx and the Iroquois signing a peace agreement. Shikoku's plans to fall back and hope Kazakhstan overextends themselves are in effect in the city of Oko as well. Based on the mini-map, Beykid has not fallen yet, so it will be a race between these two cities to see who is first to succumb to the overwhelming force of Borat references. Here we see the state of South America with Venezuelan forces crowded around the continent-spanning border with Uruguay. Hugo Chavez sends a carrier pigeon to La Vieja, warning him that his border is the line in the sand. Don't dare cross it or there will be war. The Uruguayan immortal laughs at the thought and orders his troops, Draw your swords and cross the line. And on that note, let the battle for South America commence. On the other side of the world, Nepal managed to negotiate a peace with Tongu. All it cost them was their second largest city, Gorkha. While this does reduce them to a two-city sieve, at the very least, they can still have solace in the fact that they're doing better than India, who is inexplicably still alive. Still alive. Still alive. I already sang that one. But I will say that when I asked Admiral, I thought the song was the Pearl Gem version, showing my age. Sorry. Very much less alive are the Nazca. With the fall of Paradones, they are reduced to nothing more than wandering units, all of which are out of range to retake the city before it burns to ash in the next turn. The Nazca were an interesting sieve, being overshadowed by their scarier, more broken neighbor of Uruguay for most of the pre-endgame run. At first, they were a pretty boring sieve with a lot of their PR write-ups finding nothing to write about except that their name kind of sounds like NASCAR. They proved that they were more than just a name pun in episodes 26 and 27, though, by making quick work of the Quikuran turtle that had thwarted and contained Uruguay for so long. They followed this up by quarreling with the impressive naval forces of Tonga and New Zealand at times simultaneously, and managed to amass a sizable Pacific presence. Sadly, in Endgame, they were never able to recapture the same glory before they ended their journey in much the same way they were advancing in pre-Endgame times. Out in the Pacific. F. Poor Nepal can't catch a break. Parthia declares war on them almost immediately after they were free of their war against the Tongu. Now they have another to contend with. While any war is of course not ideal for Nepal right now, at least the front line is small and mountainous. I have faith that they're going to pull through. While the Vikings look to be repelled for now, Prussia seems to fundamentally misunderstand how a navy works. Ideally, you want to have actual naval units heading up your forces, not just embarked land units. It's a bold strategy. Let's see if it pays off for them. A gaggle of now homeless Nazcan units stare at the empty island of not Paradonis anymore, pondering what to do with themselves. They could mourn the loss of their leader, whose body will have likely been buried in the ashes of Paradones, missing his head, which was apparently a common thing in Nazca culture, according to Wikipedia. If there was any doubt before, they should be cleared away now. Beykid and Oko are now firmly under the control of the Kazakh government. Tura is sweating nervously as those retreating horsemen from Beykid never quite made it home, and the city is largely undefended. Jadaran is looking considerably better off. Hey, that Uruguayan settler actually found Bermuda. Good job, guy. According to the in-game calendar, it only took him 40 years, too. Now he can settle down and retire. Sadly, the Shikoku settler was not as effective in his task. There's no sign of him or her or they on the battlefield, but the Yupik capital is in the yellow, so perhaps they were able to do some damage after all. Sakamoto has siege engines in place for bombardment, but his sole attacking trireme is also weak. Maybe he could manage an amphibious landing with that spearman. It turns out boats are better naval units than men with swords. Kberg is getting the full raid and pillage treatment by Ragnar. The Vikings want to reclaim their European holdings from before the reset, 
and so we'll need to hold on to the remaining six population in order to establish a proper foothold. Frederick flees to Danzig. Tongu not sated by their piece of Nepalese cake, I up Australia as a second dessert. Gosford is already in the yellow and the twin cities of Cairns and Queenbian are almost entirely undefended. Where is the Aussie military? Oh, here they are. They're busy failing to take Shikoku's Japanese city. With this amount of force in the area, it looks like they should have no problem taking it soon. They just need to hope that they don't also get declared on by the Chin or anything like that, but what are the odds of that happening right now? Oh, pay no attention to the war declaration on the sidebar. So, you know that old joke about being surrounded, meaning you can attack in any direction? In this case, it's actually true. This Australian flotilla could expand outwards whichever way they want and come across a nearly undefended Chin City. To quote General Chesty Puller, that simplifies the problem. It turns out men with swords are better land units than boats. This may go on for some time. My prediction is that Konigsberg will stay Prussian, but the city will be in pretty bad shape by the end of this fighting for Freddy's return, probably only at one population. Vang Nang is fixing to turn Gosford into Gooseford. The Tongu can attack and capture the city with naval units, leaving embarked land units as the only Australian units in the area to recapture. At least for the short term, it'll be tough for Oz to reclaim the island once it falls, as that amphibious modifier is a real killer this early in the game's tech tree. Are any other human players annoyed by how much gold the AI routinely hoards? It's not doing you any good in your treasury, guys. Spend it. For what it's worth, Iroquois and Zimbabwe are top dogs in the Dragon Horde Challenge at roughly the same wealth, with a sizable gap between them and the rest of the pack. Somehow Gosford is still holding on, and Operation Attack in Any Direction was a rousing success. Langjong will be an empty island in one turn, making it one less thing to worry about for Bob Hawk. This war actually isn't going all that bad. Uh, never mind, I spoke too soon. Gosford just went brown. It's like the avocado in the bowl when you make guacamole. Perfectly green and ripe one minute, and then you turn your back on it for five seconds to chop up a jalapeno and it all turns brown. The secret is to add some sour cream. Cairns and Queen Bee City are looking to follow suit, which is going to absolutely ruin the aesthetic of my tacos. There's an old adage in Civ Battle Royale history that the more hype a war is, the more likely it is to be a stagnant bore. This rumble in the jungle is proving that this is true. While the balance of power may have shifted to Uruguay, no cities are yet damaged, and there have been no changes to the borders from citadels. The front line pushed a tile or two north, but that's it. There are barely even pillaged tiles. Oko is now back in Shikoku's hands. The forces that were diverted south to recapture it should have maybe instead gone to Tura, where the situation is bleak. Oko's location is overall less defensible from the Kazakhs than Tura is, so you have to question Sakamoto's tactics. Also, check out the sidebar. Sibs are ganging up on Venice and a capital falls. Is it Indira? Nope, it's Konigsberg again. Here we see the first blood in the Moorish war against the Blind Doge. If you look closely at this slide and adjust your tinfoil hat to fit just right, you can see the Casa's belly for the war. Look carefully at Venice's army compared to the size of their territory. Notice how Venice has a military unit on all but one of their tiles. Clearly, they were trying to gunk up the game with teleporting peacekeepers again. I applaud the Moors and the Malagasy for doing their part to prevent another crash. Note, the Venetian caravels aren't actually caravels, it's a graphical bug. Those are actually Venice's second naval unique unit, which is a Carrick replacement. There is a sudden outbreak of barbarism in Australia. Is it an unhappy citizen or is it a Tongu sleeper agent? Either way, he's about to be cut down. Elsewhere on the cylinder, the Goths sign peace with Venice because they apparently want the game to crash again. Else elsewhere, a capital city flips, but the minimap isn't helping in trying to figure out which one it is. I'm sure we'll see a scene of it if it's anything important. Before I mention the war in this slide, I just want to point out that poor lost a U-Pick Trireme. That guy is a long way from home and very badly injured. 
They're in for some pretty rough times. Anyways, uh, Queen Bayon falls, and Cairns is soon to follow. Gosford doesn't look like it'll flip back to Australian control based on what we see on this slide. This theater looks grim for Old Hawk, so let's check out another one. Ah, much better. The ocean is sparse all around, and the Chin expansion in this area is getting purged with fire and resettled with nice, easier-to-pronounce Australian city names, perhaps as a mercy to me, Dawkins. Having had enough of the city trading game, Oblik Khan burns down Oko. They have a settler making their way into the Gap too, so I guess Kazakhstan are anti-Dawkins. The jerks. Trying to replace the easy city names like Oko with something more difficult. Let's see what we end up with. Tura, as predicted, turns baby blue. Looking at the sidebar, is that another capital flip? We didn't get a reclaimed icon, so I don't think it was back and forth. Definitely not a back and forth. The Yupik capital of Nug Tok has fallen to Shikoku in the culmination of the work that Flag Guy started. The icy snipers are down to two cities, but the Silver Samurai seem to have run out of steam to push the advance further. Silver Samurai, I thought it was the Silver Snakes. Meanwhile, Konigsberg is back in Prussian control. See sidebar and minimap. The days of Australian Japan are numbered as an enormous force of Chin troops descend on the city of Geelong. Predictably, any Australian offense against Yawatahama has either been diverted to Geelong for defense or destroyed. So Shikoku is going to end up with the last laugh in Japan. Cairns falls to the goo. On the plus side, the border gore is getting cleaned up in these islands. The brave you pick Trireme is still here and still not dead, but still very stuck. Poor guy probably has no idea that most of his homeland was conquered. Good news though, if and when he gets home, it will be to a nation at peace, as Sakamoto agrees to terms with Apangyokpak. Wow, Greenland got busier since we last saw it. Now that the Vikings have a city of their own and the Manx are trying to conquer some, I guess the Greenland that Admiral Cloudberg dubbed Blue Land last episode is slowly transitioning to Red Land. The Yupik Trireme will need to brush up on his Japanese if they ever make it home. It looks like Sakamoto took with the pen what he couldn't with a sword. The city of Saranik is now under Shikoku control, making it officially the first time in CBR history that an Asian civ crossed the Pacific to hold territory in mainland North America. Echoing their counterparts in South America, the Iroquois declare war on the Métis, setting the stage for what could be an epic showdown to settle the continent once and for all, but will more likely be a few border skirmishes and a white peace. Not much seems to have happened yet, but it's still the first turn of the war, and Métis' moves are currently being processed. At a glance, the city of Wood Mountain looks vulnerable and maybe cut knife after that, Iroquois units have started to pour into Métis lands, but just beyond St. Laurent de Grandin, which, is there a temple in Grandin? Uh, there is a lot of backup. The Métis are too fronting this war. They do well to clean up things over here in the Pacific to help them free resources for their new fight on the East Coast. The scandalous city of Skidigate may flip soon, and Haida's navy is looking very terrestrial right now, mostly embarked land units. Flipping it back could be problematic. Based on the sidebar notifications, Konigsberg flipped to the Vikings and then flipped back again. That quick recapture clearly gave Prussia the confidence in their army that they needed to join the Let's Not Let Venice Crash the Game Again Brigade. Of course, the Moors did a good job thinning the herd, so that risk is pretty much gone now, but it's the thought that counts. Nothing burns quite like a mountain made entirely of wood. Meanwhile, St. Laurent de Grandin is empty. No invaders or defenders. Kberg continues to swap back and forth between duck season and rabbit season as Haida's Skittigate falls to a Métis knight and finds itself slightly more on fire than it used to be. I fear that the Métis have been too hasty in relocating their troops from this front over to the east. If Koya is able to take back Skidigate, that's not much army left for Louis Rial to recapture it with. With their last conquest completely extinguished, Hiawatha's forces find one last bag of marshmallows that they weren't able to toast while the bonfire of Wood Mountain was still raging. 
They set their sights on cut knife and decide that while not as flammable as a mountain of wood, a pile of knives will probably get the job done just as well. Omayu wa mo shindairu. And just like that, Australia has been kicked out of Japan. Only damaged Australian forces are left, so there's no chance of recapture. Even if they did, Chin would just grab it right back quicker than you could say, Nani? Venice is in a pretty tough place right now. Not only are they about to be captured and eliminated, but the Moors have brought a great profit with them to knock out Venice's religion. They can counter profit for what it's worth, and they also look like they're trying to send out a settler. I guess they didn't get the memo that Bermuda was already taken. The Iroquois assert dominance in Hudson Bay by burning the city of Cutknife. It seems that no silly named cities are safe and no marshmallows shall go untoasted. Oh, and the former location of Wood Mountain is officially Terra Nullius. Somebody tell Venice quick. It has been 15 turns since this war was declared and there is still no city damage or significant change in the front lines. Venezuela is starting to repel the invaders, but they've still got a bit more work to do before they can claim victory. The sound of Konigsberg flip-flopping can be heard echoing in the distance. From the ashes of Oko comes Karamurgen. Not that bad, but I'll let Dawkins decide which is more fun name to say. I think it's Karamurgen. I guess technically it moves slightly northwest too, which will work in Kazakhstan's favor as now they can use their mountain adjacency to build an observatory in it. Meanwhile, Shikoku settles a new Oko in a highly defensible location within visibility of the front line. According to the rumor, the monument erected in the middle of the town square is in the shape of a giant middle finger facing the Kazakh capital. So here we are again. It's always such a pleasure. Remember when everyone tried to kill India twice? Oh, how Nepal laughed and laughed. And Dira wasn't laughing. Under the circumstances, she's been shockingly alive. Whoever wants Hyderabad, take it. That's what we're counting on. I used to want her nukes, but now I only want her gone. Now that the portal song joke is out of the way, a lot of stuff happened on the sidebar last scene and is still happening in this one. The focus of this scene, though, is Gosford, which may not be as permanently brown as I had previously assumed. Those Aussie ships are all ranged, so they need to keep that swordsman alive. Now that sidebar, we have not one but two joint war declarations. Australia and the Goths decide that Ragnarok is long overdue, while the Iroquois and Yupik smell hidden blood in the water. A look at the minimap shows that Skittigate was eventually reduced to burning rubble, leaving poor Koya with only two cities. In other words, you pick snipe, get hype. Meanwhile, Australia and Shikoku call it quits now that their front in Japan is no longer present, and Parthia decides to spare India, possibly in hopes that it'll somehow lead to the release of Portal 3. Ah oh, man, I knew it was a long shot for the Yupik snipe, but seeing this battlefield in detail makes it an even longer long shot, and I'm not sure the rifle scopes exist at this point in the cylinder's history for that level of marksmanship. Counting a scout, the Yupik have six military units total. If it weren't for that pesky matey, they might even run the risk of being conquered by Haida. Indeed, this war seems more than anything to be a case of Iroquois and Yupik both trying their hardest to get in Mady's good graces, and with that common enemy diplomatic bonus, which is a tall order for the Iroquois who are currently burning Mady cities. I don't have to worry about the new war, thought Ragnar. Australia is way on the other side of the cylinder, and I don't share a border with the Goths. Russia will make a nice buffer between us while we continue to flip Konigsberg over and over again. You can imagine the look on his face when one of his diplomats let him know about the peace treaty, ceding Potsdam and thus a new front line against his new enemy. Frederick laughed about it all the way to his summer home in Danzig, waving at the Gothic army on the side of the road. How long do you think they'll be able to hold it? He thought to himself with a smug grin. And Frederick barely made it down the road when we saw the smoke start to rise from the city as the clop-clop of horsemen hooves beat the road. This treaty, of course, leaves Prussia with two less cities, one of which was their capital. It's not a good position to be in, but maybe they'll be able to eke something out of their campaign in Venice. The Moorish army seemed to stall out, so maybe Prussia can pick up the slack. Save for one knight, one swordsman, and one trireme, the invading Uruguayan force has been expelled from Venezuela. 
Watch out for that swordsman, though, as depending on the AI turn orders, they could make a cheeky stab at Barco Sometto. It would immediately revert back, but would give enough time for La Vieja to take a few propaganda photos of the indifferent sun flag flying over the city. Métis forces make their way over the mountains and start bashing their swords and horses against the walls of Kung. Koya's generals, meanwhile, have more important priorities to tend to rather than defend their nation. One is in instance at this instance, insisting that the nits in the inns are in tins. Another is slowly absorbing radiation from the ground and is trying really hard not to drop a citadel even though it would, like, totally fit so perfect in the spot, guys. Seriously, look at it. Hiawatha's crazy diplomacy plan seems to have actually worked, by the way. The Métis have decided that fighting alongside the Iroquois is better than fighting against them, and make peace. The Gothic surge into the newly Viking lands is starting to get countered in earnest now, with a fair amount of swordsmen, berserkers, and catapults making their presence known. The fall of Potsdam is no longer the sure thing it looked to be a few scenes ago. If you listen carefully in the background, you can hear Frederick muttering profanity under his breath. Yep, everything's coming up Ragnar. After settling peace with Palmyra and without having to give them a city, the Vikings are now dealing with one less enemy. Of course, this violates the law of equivalent exchange, and so the universe must compensate to balance out the load. The Sami declare war and are laying down damage on the capital city of Nidaros. Ragnar is going to need to depend on those mountain choke points to slow down the land army, as Iadni has a clear advantage on the ground. On the water, I'd give the advantage to Ragnar as long as he moves that fleet on the bottom of the scene up to help defend. The Yupik are now up to 10 military units, almost doubling their army from a few turns ago. They appear to be also having an honest go at sniping Kung. Good for you, Yupik. You go, Yupik. Meanwhile, most of Haida's forces seem to have evaporated. They've only got 13 military units visible right now, and that's counting the war canoe off on holiday on the bottom left of the scene. The Tongu War reaches the shores of the home continent as Flubber begins to bash against the beaches of Brisbane. Yes, it's stuck. Aside from the small pocket of Nanets that we can see to the west of Uluru, Australia have had this entire landmass to themselves for all of Endgame so far. I, for one, am excited to see that authority be challenged and hope to see some good fights come out of this. For now, a flip looks unlikely, but the momentum in this theater has been leaning gooward for some time. Taking out Hobart would make things a lot easier for the boys in brown if they can afford to do so without taking too many losses. You pick Trireme is still there, by the way. Shikoku just cannot catch a break. They fell to reclaim Tura and now stand to lose Jadaran as well after a few painfully aggressive citadels robbed them of valuable space to maneuver. All of those wonderful early endgame gains are now moot, and Kazakh knights overpower whatever forces Sakamoto can muster. It looks like Karen is going to lose the kids. Glancing at the sidebar makes this bad situation even worse as two new enemies are joining the fray, the Métis having just concluded their war with the Haida, and their old nemesis the Chin. In Chin-adjacent lands, Shikoku forces seem to be the larger army, but the old ghosts of that pre-endgame reckoning must be haunting Shikoku fans still. The Haida have now joined India, Yupik, and Venice in the One City Club. Rubbing salt in the wounds, the mighty Métis have decided to burn Kung, along with all 823,000 inside. They don't seem to be in a rush to keep pushing onwards to take the Shikoku city out in the Aleutians, and even if they were, Haydn forces are blocking the path. Maybe Yupik can thin out the peacekeepers a bit. From Kawachi in the west to Las Piedras in the east, a great sandy curtain has descended upon this continent. That line in the sand that Uruguay decided to cross 24 turns and 240 in-game years ago when Nazca couldn't sate their hunger ultimately remained uncrossed as a peace accord is struck in South America. Now the real stalemate begins. Back in Eastern Europe, the Viking Goth War is proceeding as expected, but take a look at the bottom half of the scene. Madagascar, against all odds, managed to actually bring troops to bear in their war against Venice. How great would it be if they pulled off a snipe? 
They'd need more than just that single Vuramahari, or pikeman replacement, to do it, though, as Venice is completely undamaged. In tonight's penultimate scene, India just refuses to die. That's all there is to say here. She's tenacious. There will be no double elimination tonight. Let it be known that despite all odds, she persisted. Lime's note, Hyderabad has been continuously damaged since turn 143, 52 turns ago. When will it end? We end this episode with one last parting scene of the battle raging in Hokkaido. Shikoku are putting pressure on the city of Wangxian and could potentially start to actually expand back into their ancestral homelands in Japan. Only time and future episodes can tell for sure. So be sure to tune in again next week. Sameish bat time, same bat website. I hope you all enjoyed this episode as I had a great time putting together the narration. Stay safe, stay sane, and we'll see you next week on another very special episode of Seabricks. You kind of took all my lines out there. Uh, my name is Dawkins. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.